So uh, a multimodal map is just a map with many critical points. But I'm interested in right now in just uh, a subset of these maps, which are maps like, uh, like this. So there are maps that are uh, compositions of unimodal maps. So suppose your map is defined in three intervals, for instance, and uh, the map uh, permutates these intervals. This interval goes to the, this, the second one in the right and the third one. And the third one, when we apply F, go back to the first one. In each one of these intervals, you have a unimodal map, a map which is just one critical point. So when you make a composition of these, you get a multimodal map. To understand homomalization of multimodal maps, or to be more precise, to understand maps that infinitely homomalizable is enough to study homomalization for this kind, this subset of multimodal maps. So suppose you have uh, a map like this like, yeah, like this, okay? So suppose you have a map like this, and suppose you can find subintervals in this map, in this case, nine subintervals that are permuted by the dynamics. So in this case, you have nine intervals. The, the intervals with colors red, green, and uh, orange contains the critical points, and they are permuted by the dynamics. And after nine iterations, each one of, the, of these intervals go back in itself. In this case, you say that this map is renormalizable, and the period of renormalization is nine. And you can define the renormalization of the map F, and it's quite easy. You pick each one of these intervals that contains the critical point and normalize to the original size, like this. And you put them in the order that they appear in the uh, in the cycles or the, the cycle of harmonization. So if you pick the red interval, after two iterations you go to the orange interval, and after five iterations you go to the green one, and after two iterations you go back to the red one. So you just consider the intervals that contain the critical points, normalize them to the original size, let's say the interval zero one, and when you do that, you uh, give your origin to a new dynamical system. And this dynamical system is also a composition of unimodal maps. And this is the homomalization of the map F. So that is the, the homomalization operator for uh, multimodal maps. And the question is, what's the behavior of this operator? And we are interested in this because if you understand the behavior of the homomalization operator, you can uh, understand the behavior of maps um, generic families of, uh, well, you can use this, uh, uh, this study of the normalization operator to understand, for instance, the typical behavior of uh, maps in a family of multimodal maps. That's the ultimate goal uh, in this kind of uh, uh, study to understand the typical behavior of a multimodal map. Okay, so you have the harmonization. Yes. So this is, would be like the first return map to the, the critical, the intervals that contains the critical point, okay? But uh, you need to do different normalizations for each one of the intervals. So the, the red interval does not have the same size that the green interval, so you need to normalize them to the original size. So the normalization is different for each one of these intervals, okay? So that is the normalization operator. And there's some uh, combinatorial information in this picture, that is the disposition of these nine intervals in the phase space and how they are permuted. So this is called the combinatorics of the homization. So this is supposed to work. I hope so. Yeah. It's going to work eventually. No, it's not. Uh-huh. I think I have a bug. Okay. Aha, perfect. So if you have these nine intervals, in this case, uh, P is equal to nine, you have a cycle of intervals, and these intervals are disjoint. The uh, frontier of these intervals are per, uh, also um, 
invariant. And the critical points, all the critical points, belongs to one of these intervals. P, in, in this case, 9, is the period of the harmonization. So what's interesting about the harmonization operator is that uh, you get a new dynamical system that has the same type, the same kind that the original one. You make a kind of a high scaling of space and time, and you get the very same type of uh, dynamical system. So the question is, um, what happens if you can repeat this process infinite many times? So now you get a new multimodal map. You can normalize again, maybe, and again, and again, and again, infinite many times. Well, there is no loss of generality with that, because if it's infinitely normalizable, so I'm actually, yes. So I'm actually trying to understand what happens when you iterate infinite many times. So that's the only important, uh, relevant situation for this kind of study. And that was, was the reason why I'm interested just in compositions of unimodal maps. Because um, if you pick a map that's infinitely homolizable, deep homolizations are compositions of unimodal maps. So there are, no lo uh, there are not laws of generality. Uh, just fix uh, this kind of maps. OK. Wait. And OK, so a map is infinitely homolizable. If you can repeat the process, you can apply the homolization operator infinitely many times. And for each one of these times that you apply, you have a period of homolization. That's Pn here. And you say that uh, you have a B bounded combinatorics if this quotient of consecutive periods are uniformly bounded by this constant B. And uh, in this work, uh, you just consider bounded combinatorics. Good. Good. OK. So the main result is the following. Suppose you have a finite dimensional smooth family of real analytic multimodal maps. So I'm just considering real analytic multimodal maps. But the family does not need to be real analytic. It could be just. Uh, C1 plus alpha, uh, C2 uh, family of uh, real analytic multimodal maps. And you can consider in this family the subset of parameters where the map is infinitely homolizable with the bounded combinatorics. So this is a subset, is a closed subset in, this, uh, in, in the parameter space. And the main theorem is the following. For a generic finite dimensional family, Ft, the set of parameters that are infinite homolizable with B bounded combinatorics has zero Lebesgue measure. So that the saying that uh, most of the parameters are not homolizable with B bounded combinatorics. That uh, sounds a little disappointing because it's kind of just a very small set. But actually, if you understand the uh, geometric behavior of the operator on these parameters, you can say uh, sometimes lots of things about uh, other parameters. Okay, so that's uh, saying that you don't need to worry too much about these uh, parameters because they are very, very small. Good. Yeah, I suppose the house dimension is strictly smaller than the dimension of the parameter space, but uh, I didn't prove that. But I think it's true, and uh, but I don't have the proof. Okay. Say. Uh, ah yes, pro probably positive house dimension, but it's still smaller than the dimension in the uh, of the parameter. <coughs> okay. So uh, just just to clarify what I mean by generic uh, finite dimensional family of uh, multimodal maps. So you can consider, uh, so in this setting, you're just fixing a neighborhood of these intervals. In your case, in the case of the picture, you had three intervals. So you fix a complex neighborhood of these intervals. And you consider just uh, complex analytic maps defined in this neighborhood that is real on the real line. 
and continues in the frontier of this complex domain. So this is a Banach space. And you can consider generic CK families of uh, points in this uh, Banach space. Okay? And uh, you, you can also consider generic real analytic families in this space. So that's what I mean by generic. Yeah, I know. It is low. Okay. So there are, we already know some facts uh, about the harmonization operator. And uh, for multimodal, you know a lot by works of Dwadi Hubbard, Sullivan, McMullen, Lubitsch, and there are also later work by Avila, Lubitsch, and De Mello, uh, Edson Faria for uh, Alberto Pinto, and De Mello for CR maps. And you have some results for multimodal case too. There is a former student of um, Dan Sullivan, uh, who, and uh, my PhD thesis in Something like that, probably I pronounce it in the wrong way, uh, the name of the guy. But anyway, so uh, what we know? We knew that if you pick an infinite homolizable map, when you take the homolizations of this map, this is a sequence that's pre-compact. So this is called complex bound. And you have some universality behavior for this homolization operator. So you pick two maps. Uh, you pick a map that's infinite homolizable. So you can find another map in the omega limit set uh, of this homolization operator that uh, the homolizations of these two maps uh, approaches infinitely uh, exponentially fast, very fast. So this, uh, this is what's called universality. The geometric behavior on the homolization operator uh, on these uh, maps uh, is very well uh, known. So that's also saying somehow that F and F star belongs to the same stable manifold of the homization operator. OK. Say again. So F is real analytic. And uh, F star is better than that. It's a real analytic with a polynomial-like uh, extension. But I need more information to get my, uh, the main results. I need more information about the behavior of the homization operator. So the first step is that if you just consider the homization operator acting on maps in the interval, uh, he's not a very good uh, operator. He's not differentiable. So what you need to do is consider complex analytic maps in a neighborhood, a certain special neighborhood of these intervals, uh, of real intervals and make some kind of complexification of the homization operator. I'm not going to explain that, but it is a consequence of the complex bounds. And uh, what you get? You get that the homization operator is actually, uh, in this extension, is a complex analytic map, and is a compact complex analytic map in a, bu in a Banach space. So you have all kinds of uh, nice uh, properties, analytical properties for this homization operator now. The main uh, step in the proof is to prove that the omega limit set of the homization operator is hyperbolic. You can have, uh, actually have some kind of horseshoe, hyperbolic horseshoe on this omega limit set. The third step is to prove that if you pick a family, so now you have, uh, I can make, draw a picture here. So you have this omega limit set, there's a counter set. So this is a counter set, as you can see. And uh, for each one of this, this, um, this set is a hyperbolic for the homization operator. So you have the stable nomination passing through this guy. So now what you do, you want to study uh, families of maps. So you want to study curves in this picture. So suppose that this family of multimodal maps that you pick is transversal to the stable lamination like this. So we are going to see that uh, after an easy adaptation of the results of Boeing, who only for a finite dimensional hyperbolic sets, you can prove that the set of parameters in this family that intersects the lamination has zero Lebesgue measure. So most of the parameters does not intersect the stable lamination. 
And the stable lamination is exactly the set of infinitely formalizable maps with B bounded combinatorial. Okay, I didn't respect the, the restraints. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the third step. And the last step that's actually uh, kind of uh, very short is to prove that if you prove that for transversal families of multimodal maps, you actually prove the same results for generic families of multimodal maps. And I'm going to explain this later. It's just application of uh, Fubini theorem. So the main step is actually the second one, to prove that the omega limit set is hyperbolic. And I'm going to explain this step now, if I have time. Say again? Uh, just bounded combinatorics, yes. So I'm fixing some B and understand this kind of thing. Okay. So what we know, okay, this is the third step. So it's better to explain this uh, first. So uh, I have a drawing actually. So I have this thing. So if you pick a, a hyperbolic set, as I said, you have the stable nomination. And you can prove using the same argument as uh, Boeing and Huali did that uh, this formula intersects the stable nomination in a set of uh, zero Lebesgue measure. The fourth step, uh, the last step, is actually Fubini theorem. Suppose now you pick a family that is not transversal to the stable lamination. And how you prove that uh, you can perturb this family just a little bit in such a way to get uh, the result. What you do is the following. You pick some transversal directions. You pick some V that is transversal, some direction that's transversal to the stable lamination and you construct a new family. So this is the parameter space of the original family FT. What you do is build a family with a higher dimension just in adding perturbations in the direction, in the transversal direction. So lambda is the, now you have two parameters, T and lambda. And this family is defined actually in a larger uh, parameter space with a larger dimension. And now, if you consider horizontal lines in this parameter, in this parameter space, horizontal lines, they correspond to transversal families. No, because they are following the red, uh, the red directions. So these families are transversal. So the third step works for these families. So for almost. Uh, every parameter in the red lines, in each one of the red lines, for almost every parameter, you don't intersect the uh, stable lamination. Say again? So a transversal family is, by definition, a family that is transversal to the stable lamination. OK? Yes, that's the notion of transversal family. OK? And uh, that, that essentially means that the families uh, pass through all the topological classes, right? The transversal way. So now, each one of these family, almost every parameter does not intersect the stable nomination. So by Fubini uh, theorem, for almost every parameter in the rectangle, you don't intersect the stable nomination. And the, Um, well, in this case, because these families are families of, um, of um, infinite normalizable maps, there is not a formula like a Tsuji transversality condition. For Kala Ekman, you have this explicit formula to a family to be transversal to that parameter. But in this case, you don't have. I mean, you have a functional, a linear functional that I don't have as explicit formula to, 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 to give you. OK. so. Uh, if this is true, then for almost every vertical, um, vertical uh, family like this, you have that inter intersection has zero Lebesgue measure. 
So you, the original family is the family in black. So you perturb a little bit, you can find red, uh, green families approaching the original family that uh, satisfies the, what you wanted to prove, that the intersection has zero Lebesgue measure. And that's it, basically. And then you need to make, so this proves actually that the families are dense. That satisfies my assumption. My, my conclusion is dense. But then you make some uh, easy argument and you prove that it's actually genetic. Okay? So that's the, how you prove the third and the fourth uh, step of the proof. So what is really uh, difficult is to prove the third step, to prove that the homomorphization operator is hyperbolic. And to do this, I need to introduce a concept that is are going to be crucial in the, the main step of the proof that are quasi-conformal vector fields. So it's quite easy. Uh, if you pick a map, uh, a function uh, alpha, define it in subset of the complex plane, you say that's quasi-conformal. If uh, this uh, function has uh, distributional derivatives that is square, locally square integral, and d bar of alpha is uniformly bounded uh, by some constant. And d bar is defined in that way if you don't remember. So d bar equals to zero means that this, fun this map, this function is a Lamarck function, okay? And d bar b small means that you're close to a Lamarck function somehow, okay? Okay, why am I saying, uh, telling you this? Because with uh, the concept of quasi-conformal vector fields, you can define horizontal directions. So if you consider the, 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 the maps which are infinite homolizable, um, the topological class of these maps are manifolds. I'm not going to use this in the proof, but uh, it's true. So the topological class of these maps are manifolds. And the codimension of these manifolds are finite dimensional. They are finite dimensional. And the, dimension, the codimension uh, sorry, uh, the codimension is finite, and the codimension is the number of critical points. So in my picture, the codimension is three. So how you characterize the tangent space of the topological class using horizontal directions? So suppose uh, I pick a polynomial-like map. I'm not going to explain what is this now. But uh, you say that a direction in the tangent space of this map is horizontal, if there exists a quasi-conformal vector field that satisfies this equation. So V is given, and if you can find alpha that satisfies this equation, in such a way that alpha is a quasi-conformal vector field, you say that V is horizontal. So this is a subspace of all possible directions. You can perturb F. So you, you can see, uh, you should see V has an infinitesimal perturbation of f. And there is one more additional assumption that uh, d bar of alpha is equal to zero on, on the fillet in Julia set. But this is actually not uh, too important in this setting because this is also true for infinite homolizable maps, multimodal infinite homolizable maps, uh, because they don't have invariant line fields on the Julia set. So this is kind of automatic. So if you consider the set of all horizontal directions, this is a subspace, and the codimension uh, is the number of critical points um, involved in this homomorphization. Cool. And you know a lot about the behavior of the homomorphization operator in the horizontal directions. First, you have continuity. These horizontal directions if you pick an infinite homolizable map and move this, so for each one of these, you have the horizontal space. And the horizontal space is moving in a continuous way with f. Second, this uh, vector bundle of horizontal directions is invariant by the derivative of the horizontal operator. It's like an unstable or stable direction of a hyperbolic uh, set. And actually, this direction you are going to see is the stable direction of a normalization operator. And the last condition is saying exactly that these directions, you have contractions, so these directions belong to the stable direction of the normalization operator. 
and later you're going to see that's actually equal to the stable direction. So we know a lot what happens. With, yes. So the norm is the norm of the, um, you have this Banach space of uh, complex functions. So it's the soup norm in this Banach space of complex functions. So, um, actually it is. So if you think this Banach space and uh, you take the normalization, if you f uh, choose this in a curve, yes, I'm using the complex bounds. It's exactly the trick that you, uh, you use with uh, uh, little bit, uh, uh, sorry, with uh, Alberto Pinto and Wellington. And Wellington used it with Liubic and uh, Avila and uh, uh, Avila and Liubic in another paper. Exactly. So if you choose, you should choose in a smart way. And that's complicated. I'm not actually uh, explaining this. So you have this contraction. And now, OK. So you have this finite condimensional subspace where you know what, what happens there, the dynamics there. So what about the transversal directions? Now you need to understand what happens there in these transversal directions. Yes. No, this, uh, this is actually, is, uh, I'm not explaining details because it's quite similar for one right. model. So the contraction direction is uh, quite similar. What is interesting in the transversal direction. Okay. So it, there are many ways to prove this contraction. You can use a Dennis Sullivan argument, original argument, or maybe Mac McMullen original that I'm using, or maybe uh, the, original, the new argument by Avila and, and Lilbich. Yes, yeah, so this is basically the same in the contraction that's why I'm not uh, explaining this in, the, in details. Okay. Yes. Yes. No, no, no. If you start with real analytic map, then uh, and this map is infinitely normalizable. So a deep normalization has this polynomial-like extension after some maybe large iterations. So if you are just uh, uh, wanted to understand what happens in the omega limit set, you don't actually need to consider this case. So, okay. so now, what about the transversal direction that uh, has Enrique uh, suggested? It's the interesting part, actually. I suggest that, the interesting part. Okay, so how you detect, oh, okay, so how you detect Hyperbolicity. Oh, they are recording that, right? Okay. Yeah. okay. <clears throat> oh, that's bad. So, uh, how you detect hyperbolicity? So, for linear maps, it's kind of easy. So, if you have a hyperbolic linear map, when you iterate points on the unstable direction, the stable uh, subspace, um, these vectors, the red vectors, grows when you iterate. And if you pick vectors in the stable direction, when you iterate backwards, they also expand. The blue interval, the blue vectors expand when you go to the past. So a characterization of hyperbolic linear maps is this one. A map, uh, a linear map, a finite dimensional linear map is hyperbolic if you only if. Yes, exactly. So someone is following. Thank you. Yes. Great. So if it is hyperbolic, OK, it's hyperbolic if you only if. The only vector that, when you iterate backwards and forward, has bounded orbit, the only vector with a bounded orbit, a full bounded orbit, is 0. And actually, it's not that uh, I don't have an elementary proof of that. You need to use a Jordan block uh, decomposition maybe to prove that. I don't know if that is the easiest way to, to do that. So that's a nice way to, to, to prove uh, hyperbolicity. And the difficulty is like, like that. Suppose you have a, a, a linear transformation, and you iterate that uh, vector, and you know that the size of this 
is always like n, the order of n. So you want to prove that uh, there exists an eigenvalue, uh, lambda, with the norm equals to 1. So we have an orbit that maybe is not bounded like this one, but does not grow too fast. And you wanted to prove that there is an orbit that is bounded, that is actually the, the eigenvectors of this eigenvalue. So this is not so, so obvious, actually. It's good to give a, this in a test or something. So how, I wanted to apply this, so, but there are some difficulties here. Because first, this is just a linear map. And the homomorphization operator is acting, acting in an omega, omega limit set that's a counter set. So it's a co-cyclo. It's not uh, just a linear map. And uh, it's infinite dimensional. In this set, you have finite dimension. So to do this, I'm going to use um, uh, something very cool that I result by Sucker and Cell in the 70s. So the setting is the following. Suppose you have a homeomorphism uh, where minimal sets are dense on the phase space. So x contains, for instance, periodic points are dense on x. Okay? Like a, if you have a shift, a full shift, periodic points are dense. So um, you, you have this situation. And suppose you have a co-cycle uh, defined on this x. So it's just a skill product between the homomorphism f and uh, the multiplication by an invertible matrix on, on R, OK? Like that. So the question is, when this co-cyclo uh, co -cyclo is hyperbolic, how you check that this co-cyclo is hyperbolic? And you can define the sets of vectors that the full orbit is bounded. And uh, T is a uh, hyperbolic co-cycle, if only if B is the trivial section. So that is uh, uh, like uh, if you think in a generalization of the statement for hyperbolic maps, that's the it's kind of nature. And the proof is actually quite uh, elementary. I mean, it's not easy, but it's quite elementary. You can find in this uh, paper. And uh, here I stated uh, the result for trivial vector bundles, but actually uh, works for, uh, for no trivial vector bundles, too. I just didn't write down because it's more boring to, to write down uh, in this notation for general vector bundles. So I'm going to use this. To prove that something hyperbolic, is just need to prove that the only vector with bounded orbit is the trivial vector. But I cannot apply this directly because this is for finite dimensional co-cycles. So what I do is the following. I just pick my helomization operator, the derivative of the helomization operator, and take the quotient. So if I pick a f in the omega limit set of helomization operator, I can consider that the space, the Banach space where the helomization operator is acting, and taking the quotient by the horizontal direction. Because in the horizontal direction, I know what happens. You have contraction already. So don't worry about this part. I want to get rid of this part. So when you pick the Banach space and take the quotient by this finite co-dimensional horizontal direction, you get a uh, finite dimensional space. And <clears throat> what is nice is that this horizontal direction is invariant. So you can take the quotient of the action of the derivative of the normalization operator. The derivative of the normalization operator preserves the horizontal directions, actually forward and backward. So you can take the quotient of the action, and you get a finite dimensional cost cycle. And there is an important step here, maybe a little technical, but an uh, important step here that uh, the, the image of these derivatives of the normalization operator is dense. That means that when you take the quotient, you get an invertible cost cycle. So now I can apply the criterion of Sucker and Cell for this quotient co-cycle. And yes. Yes, it's the number of critical points, exactly, in the, or the number of unimodal parts that you pick. 
So to prove that the homogenization operator is hyperbolic is enough to prove, using this argument, you can prove that if you prove that uh, the randomization, the derivative of the randomization operator, when you iterate forward, uh, sorry, pick a vector in such a way that you, when you iterate forward, you get a bound orbit. If you prove that this vector belongs to the horizontal direction, you actually prove that the stable direction of the randomization operator coincides with the horizontal direction, and the randomization operator is hyperbolic. So the only thing that you need to prove is this statement. Points, vectors with a four or bounded forward orbits belongs to the horizontal direction. You cannot iterate backwards the randomization operator because it's, it's not invertible. OK. Well, not, uh, not the derivative of the randomization operator. It's not invertible. It's a compact operator. The quotient is invertible, exactly. So, yes, exactly. So the key lemma, the technical step to prove is actually this. Pick a vector, an infinite harmonizable map, and a vector v. And suppose that when you iterate forward, you have a bounded orbit. You need to prove that this vector v belongs to the horizontal direction. And to prove that, you actually need to find a quasi-conformal vector field that satisfies this cohomological equation. So I give you V with that property, and you need to prove that there is alpha satisfying this equation. And alpha should be regular enough, should be quasi-conformal. So that's the key lemma. And now I'm going to give an idea about how you actually built this alpha. You actually built this alpha by hand. So. The main gradient in this part is the infinitesimal pullback argument. And this was proven by Avila Lilbic in the Mello uh, 10 years ago. <laughs> I cannot distinguish. They're all the same for me. Yeah. OK. So <clears throat> look more three Wellingtons for me. But anyway. So to find uh, quasi-conformal vector field solution for that equation. What you need to find is a solution in the blunder of the domain of the maps and in the post-critical set. So you have this infinite normalizable map F, and you have the post-critical set, the image, the orbit of the critical point. The orbit of the critical point is an infinite orbit. So you f if you find a quasi-conformal vector field that satisfies this equation, in the post-critical set, satisfies this equation on the post-critical set. And in the frontier, oh, OK, frontier of the domain, well, I need to be more precise, but in the domain, then you can use this trick, this uh, really powerful trick to build a quasi-conformal vector field that satisfies the equation everywhere. Okay? And uh, I can explain to you in more details in a situation where you don't have a post-critical set, where you don't have critical points, actually. And that's actually the situation where I'm going to use this uh, method. So suppose you have a conformal iterated uh, function system. So you have two uh, you have a function that is defined, let's say, in two components. In each one of these components, this map is univalent and maps each one of the blue uh, connect regions in the red one, in the big red one. So you can prove that uh, using hyperbolic dynamics that uh, there is a counter set inside the blue regions that's invariant by the, by, the, by the dynamics and has zero Lebesgue measure and blah, blah, blah. So, the problem now is the following. I give you V, define it in the blue regions, and you wanted to find a quasi-conformal vector field that satisfies this equation everywhere in the blue region. So how do you do that? Easy. First, you solve. Here, you don't have critical points. So you solve the equation on the boundary of the domains. 
So you define alpha equals to zero in the, blond in the blunder of the head domain and define alpha equals to minus v over the derivative of f in the, in the frontier of the blue, uh, the blue regions. And then you'd extend this alpha in a quite arbitrary way outside the blue, the blue regions. So you define like that. Okay? Now you have a solution uh, in the boundary of the blue regions, and you can now extend the solution for the blue regions, doing the same argument. Using that equation, you can extend this over and over again, uh, extending to the whole domain, except the counter set. But in the counter set, you make a kind of a limit process and you extend the solution everywhere. OK, sorry. <laughs> now, I wanted to use the same argument in my case, but in my case, I have a critical point. So I, I wanted to get rid of the critical points, and to do that, what I do is take an induced map. So I'm going to explain this with one critical point, because uh, if I put more critical points, uh, the, the, the drawing are going to be, uh, the picture is going to be too complicated. So in this case, you have a pair doubling case. You have two intervals. The green one is mapped in the blue one. The blue one is mapped in the green, in the green one. So my induced map is like that. In the blue interval, it's just f. But now the second helminalization, you have also two intervals there, the green and the blue one. And in the blue, the new blue one, you define it has the second iteration, and so on and so forth. So you just continue this process, pick the second iteration, and then the fourth iteration, and then the iteration number eight, eight is so on and so forth. So you get a sequence of, brain, of uh, restrictions of iterations of f. And this, uh, they are defined in these blue intervals that are converging to the ghost of the critical point that is more or less here. Okay? So now the critical point disappears. You have just maps that you, is, uh, are piecewise, is a piecewise diffuse. And actually, this is expanding. It's an expanding map. But to use the infinitesimal pullback argument, I need to use complex maps. I need to use maps that are defined in complex uh, regions, uh, the regions in the complex plane, domains in the complex plane. So I just complexify this. I pick uh, balls, more or less, it's not exactly balls, but uh, topological bo disks around these intervals. And the image of these intervals are the pink region. So that big ball there goes to this big uh, pink region. This later one goes to the, the next one, and so on and so forth. So we have a sequence of univalent branches. And each one of these branches is, is mapped in, the, in these pink balls, like this. You need to reduce a little bit the domains just to make things easier. OK. So, um, the, the so, uh, how you do the, the, how you solve the equation. To solve the equation, what you do is the following. You take the inducent equation. Instead of the original equation that's written there, you take the inducent equation for the iterations of the original map. And when you take the inducent equation to the iteration, you get something like this. If you iterate the map 2 to the power n times, n minus 1 times, you get an equation like that. Alpha should satisfy this equation. And this, in particular, for the blue, blue regions. So you need to find a solution for this, for every n and every un. And how you do that? If you analyze uh, this, uh, the left side of this equation more carefully, you can relate it that with the normalization operator. So the left side can be written in terms of the derivative of normalization operator. You pick the, the derivative of normalization operator and make a hay scaling by this p n naught, and you get essentially what is in the left side plus this second part that's actually the complicated part to deal with. That is basically 
this uh, beta is just a conformal linear map, uh, vector field. It's just y multiplied by a number. Don't worry about what this number is. And uh, multiplied by the derivative of f. Looks uh, ugly, but what is nice about this solving this cohomological equation is that it's a linear problem. So you solve the equation replacing v by w1, uh, wv1, and solve the equation replacing v by wv2. Solve the two equations and then add, add the two solutions. You get the solution for the original problem. So that's what I'm going to do. So I don't have too much time. You probably are tired, me too. So I'm going to just give you an idea about how you deal with the second part that's the most uh, complicated one for WV2. How you deal with that? It's kind of uh, interesting. So in this case, uh, WV2 is like this. So because the derivative of the, now you, you need to use uh, what you know about the iterations of the derivative of the homogeneous operator. It's uniformly bounded by some constant. Using that, you can prove that this constant that apply uh, is in the front of uh, x is, uh, satisfies this equation. You have this sequence of cn of numbers, and the consecutive terms of the sequence, the distance is uniformly bounded by c. So the idea is to solve the equation uh, defining some alpha 2 in that way. It's some function psi multiplied by x. And actually, psi, the, the, the psi depends only on the modulus of x. And how you do that? You do it that way. You pick, you conform an iterated dynamical system. And you are just seeing one of the scales of that. You have uh, infinite many blue domains. The map uh, is symmetric with respect to the critical point because uh, f belongs to the omega limit set. In the omega limit set, you have just symmetric maps. Okay, very symmetric. So you have a picture like like that, and you define psi has c n in this green region, big green region, and has c n plus one in the next region, and you just interpolate that, make a linear interpolation and you glue together the two regions. When you glue together, you get psi. And psi looks like, looks like this. You define has Cn in each one of these uh, sizes, scales, and make a linear interpolation. And then you define this alpha 2 in that way. And that is going to be the solution of the cohomological equation, okay? So for uh, the second part that is WV1 is actually simpler because in that, that part you have the, it's just the derivative of the operator making a high scaling. So in this case, you see exactly the same thing in all scales. So you just define what should be in this scale, define what should be in the other scale, and put zero in the middle, and uh, yeah. You put a zero in the middle, and you find a solution. Of course, uh, it's easier in that way, it's easier in this situation, because it's just one critical point, and it's period doubling. But uh, to write down to, to uh, no uh, periodic combinatorial is more complicated. But the idea is pretty much the same. So that's why we want to talk. Thank you very much for your attention.